all medical colleges may have to close down because artificial intelligence will make diagnosis by itself and treat you by itself. So, it is time the young doctors who are coming up now should focus on how you should be able to look beyond the symptoms. You must allow the deeper intelligence within you to function. I have back pain, so I have a medicine for a one and a half month. Now I have a lot of better. I have a lot of practice. But in the Siddha medicine, I have a metal collector. I have a lot of Ayurveda. 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 Essentially, the difference between Ayurveda and Siddha and allopathy is just this. Allopathy is purely chemicals, chemical manipulation of the system. When it's an emergency, you must use it. But if it's a long… you know, if it's a chronic ailment which is going to be with you for a long time and you're going to take some medicine for a long time, definitely popping pills for long periods of time is not a good thing. So Ayurveda is herbal. Herbs are also chemicals. But in natural form, it's way better than taking it in a synthetic form. Ayurveda needs a certain amount of application and knowledge because there are over three hundred thousand, okay, three hundred thousand Ayurvedic formulations according to the ancient texts. Three hundred thousand formulations you have to understand if you have to really prescribe Ayurveda. So, uh, prescribing or practicing Ayurveda is a… it needs a lifelong involvement. These days I see people come from outside the country, they study Ayurveda for one and a half months and uh, they're certified Ayurvedic teachers or doctors, practitioners, which is a very dangerous thing to do. Three hundred thousand formulations, how to give it, whom to give it, when to give it, it's not a simple thing to understand, it takes a lot. Above all, you need a phenomenal understanding of the body to be able to prescribe this. Siddha is very different in the sense, Siddha is essentially elemental in nature. There's… there are herbs, but essentially it's elemental in nature. It comes more from the yogic science because the fundamental of yogic science is in Bhuta Shuddhi or in cleansing of one's elements. This is an evolution from the yogic science and Siddha Vaidya was essentially formulated by Agastya Muni and they say Adiyogi himself practiced it and Agastya brought it to the south and only in the south it lived, nowhere else and it's elemental in nature, which… Uh, which needs less study but more internal mastery for the person who practices it, which is again a problem today. We hope these young people who are uh, starting their sadhana at the age of six and they are going to be in sadhana throughout their growing period, these kind of people can take to siddha very effortlessly because the necessary sadhana is there within them. Siddha Vaidya cannot happen without sadhana. Today they have set up colleges for Siddha Vaidya which… Uh, it will not work like that. They're picking up bits and pieces from the text and trying to practice that. Quackery, Siddha quackery is happening. Siddha Vaidya is not happening because Siddha Vaidya has to be practiced by a Siddha. It is a Siddha who can practice Siddha Vaidya. Siddha means an established one, one who is firmly established within himself because it's elemental in nature. Because it's elemental, it's not really a medicine as such. You are uh, dealing with the fundamental material which makes the body. You're not trying to infuse some other medicine into it. So usage of metals is very much prevalent in uh, Siddha. I know the Western medicine will 
immediately brand it as nonsense. But in Siddha, all the things that you consider as poisonous are used as a part of their medicine. Nine deadly poisons, you heard of Navapashana. All the nine deadly poisons are used as medicine. Lead is very frequently used, mercury is regularly used. Rasavaidya is very much part of Siddhavaidya. And for those of you who are calling for God's help, when I mention the word mercury, mercury is not poisonous. It is just with mercury oxides people have poisoned water. It is irresponsible usage in the industry which has done this. There is mercury in the soil, okay? We did not import mercury from Mars. It's always been in this planet. It is not poison. It is mercury oxides which are irresponsibly used in industry and let out into the rivers and lakes which poisoned the waters on this planet. Now they think mercury is poison. No, mercury is not poison. But if you drink it, it'll kill you. Not… not because you can absorb it as poison. It is because of its sheer weight. If you put it into the stomach, it will not go through the pipe. It will just drip through the stomach because of its sheer weight. Because its specific gravity is almost fourteen times uh, that of water. Because of that, because of sheer weight, if you place it in your hand, it just goes into your hand through the pores. Similarly, if you put it into the stomach, it will go through the stomach, it will not go through the intestine. Because of that, it may kill you, because it bores holes. Not because it's acidic, simply because of sheer weight. But consumption of mercury is very much a part of the yogic system and very much a part of the Siddha Vaidya. I am still alive only because of mercury, not otherwise. So, Siddha is a very completely different kind of medicine system than anything that you will find on the planet, but it needs a Siddha to give Siddha medicine. If you are not established, if you can't hold the mercury, you don't give hope mercury to somebody else. Yogic system has always used mercury. Mercury and yogis are always together, you cannot. Even you will see, traveling yogis will carry a little bit of mercury with them always. If not in liquid form, in solid form, solidified mercury, people do practices keeping it in their mouth and doing things and whatever. There are various aspects to it. Nobody try that here, okay? We don't want you dead. It's not just bad things that kill you, good things that you're not ready for can kill you. The antibiotic resistance is increasing day by day and uh, Ayurvedic practices are declining day by day. So mm -hmm. how do we create a perfect amalgamation between the practices of Ayurveda and allopathy? Ayurveda and Siddha and naturopathy is growing big time in the West, particularly in Europe, very big. In India, of course, it's dying because they have to approve it for us to take it. Without their approval, we cannot take it. But we must understand the difference between allopathy and these other Indian systems. Right now, an Ayurvedic doctor is going to another medical college just like you go for four years or five years or whatever. So what he's learning is a downgraded medicine downgraded understanding. An Ayurvedic doctor or one who wants to practice Ayurveda should not go to a four-year uh, course. You have to invest your life in it, otherwise it won't happen. Traditionally, from childhood, they learn to feel the herbs, they learn to feel the people, the pulse and this and that. This is a developing a certain intuition where we don't go by the symptoms that you're showing on your body right now. We don't see your temperature and say, this is what it is. We don't look at those symptoms. We learn to look much deeper into the system to identify what exactly is right and wrong with your system. This will take a different level of involvement. That involvement is missing right now. We are looking at things, if I do this much, I must get this job or I must get this place in the world. With this, these systems may not function very well. You must have heard this, 
The same medicine one doctor gives in Ayurveda and Siddha, the same dog medicine in one person's hands it works very well, in another person's hands it doesn't work well because the person who gives it is as important as the medicine. Because it's not working just by its chemical composition, the entire allopathic system is working out of chemical composition. Anyway, there is a danger that in the next twenty-five years, all medical colleges may have to close down. Because artificial intelligence will make diagnosis by itself and treat you by itself. Surgeries are all happening now, robotic surgeries are happening. Still human beings are needed because machines need to be upgraded. But in twenty-five years' time, even today, in United States, I know doctors, I saw a doctor who, whom I know very well, he is carrying an old Blackberry, the first model that came which is that thick and a huge capability. Every time any patient, whatever, he just goes there into his Blackberry. I said, what are you looking in the phone and treating people? He said, no Sadhguru, the entire… all my textbooks are here in this phone. I'm just looking and telling them. So if you can look, the phone can become smart enough now that it will tell by itself. If you just tell the symptoms to Alexa, she will tell you <laughs> what you should do <laughs> So, this form of symptomatic treatment may become irrelevant after some time because you're just gathering data and processing it and giving an answer. This a machine will be able to do better than any human being because it can process much faster and much better, not miss anything. So, it is time the young doctors who are coming up now should focus on how you should be able to look beyond the symptoms. This is what Ayurveda and Siddha is significant about. There was a yogi with whom I volunteered for some time for his uh, medical camps that he used to have. It was like a festival, okay, for everybody who comes to him, he has a joke to tell them and it goes on like a festival, simply something he will give and people are cured, thousands of people will queue up for him every day. And he himself lived to be one not six. So if somebody lives for hundred and six years of age, not in a geriatric state, fully active till the last day of his life, he must know something about health, isn't it? Hello? My great-grandmother lived to be one one three, hundred and thirteen years of age. I will tell you, this is… this may sound absurd to you, but you must listen to this because if you are not open, there will be no new learning. Well, I saw her only after she is hundred, but she was still very active. She was living all by herself in an open field. She built a small temple for herself, not for a god, for herself. She built a temple and she sat in it <laughs> because she felt she deserves a temple. <laughs> this is very common in India, especially women, older women, built small temples, they sat there and they served humanity in a different way, in their own way. So when we went there for vacations and all, she would come home. If you give her breakfast, she will take this and put it to the ants, to the squirrel, to the sparrows, everything. Most of the breakfast is gone like this. There are self-appointed advisors who look at this and say, you old woman, you don't eat anything, you will die. They all died <laughs> And she will simply sit there, Looking at these sparrows and ants eating, simply tears would be rolling from her eyes. And uh, when somebody said, you've not eaten, she said, I'm full. I thought she was very emotional about the ants because I was just four or five years of age. I was going stamping the ants, <laughs> chut, chut, chut. The best thing is she never stopped me. She never said, don't do that. She knew she's doing what she has to do for the ants. Ants are doing what they should do for their life. I am as a child doing what I have to do as a child. When I sometimes saw her like this and I asked, what is this happening to you? She would just laugh loudly 
And she would say, someday you will know. It took me over twenty-five years to know this, that your life is not nourished hundred percent by the food that you consume and things that you do. Life is a bigger phenomena than what you think in your head, much larger. Before you came, this cosmos was there, everything was working. After you and me are gone, still it'll be fine, isn't it? There is an intelligence beyond you. Don't immediately quantify it as God, this, that, because you're making a conclusion about things that you do not know. If you stay here, this is very important, if you live here, clearly knowing you don't know a damn thing about anything, your intelligence will remain alert to everything. But you make conclusions, reading a book, listening to this and that nonsense, you say, I know this, I know that, I know that. The moment you identify with your knowledge, you will become very small because it doesn't matter how much you know, still what you know is a minuscule in this existence, isn't it? But our ignorance is boundless. This is called as the intelligence of ignorance. If you always know that you do not know, your intelligence will remain super alert. Whether your body is awake or asleep, it will remain super alert. This is what a doctor must do because, I'm sorry to say such things, you may know medicine, you might have read all the books in the world, you might have treated many patients, but still, everything seems to be perfect, somebody will die in your hands. Everything looks like he's going to die, he will sit up tomorrow morning. You will see this happening, yes or no? So, there is intelligence beyond you and me, there's an intelligence which makes us happen, there's an intelligence which can make a mango into a human being. If you don't allow that to function within you, if you think everything is in your head, you will become a dumb doctor. You must allow the deeper intelligence within you to function.